Um, thank you very much for being here. Welcome. Apology for the strange venue. We've moved this venue three, four times in the past few days. Firstly, because our illustrious speakers attracted so much attention that the original venue in the mood court was too small. Uh, then we got a venue next door which, where the air conditioning didn't work. And now we have this one where there's no air conditioning. But um, apparently it can take even a few more people. So um, please put yourself in a position where you can see in here properly. We will close some of the doors just now. We want some air circulation. People will speak from the podium, but the panel will sit here. So, thank you very much. <coughs> I will just now talk about the panel. Let me explain why we are here. Um, of course, this is essentially a class for my students in the final year course called... Um, uh, what is it called again? <laughs> the, the name is so long, I think it can change. The name is, of course, is the practice, Practicing Human Rights and Constitutionalism in Law and Life. And we have given some attention to life, not only the law. Uh, but we opened it, uh, and I promised my students from the beginning of the year that we will have something like this. But then when I saw the interest, we opened it to everybody, to other students. There are staff members here. I'm not going to single out anybody. We appreciate very, very much that you are here. So just tell people outside to be either quiet or close the doors. Why, Why this topic? <coughs> um, I will be very brief here. I will come back to the panel just now. Why this topic? At the Constitutional Court, where I sat with my colleagues, Mosineke and Yakub, we idolized the Constitution and we applied it as the supreme law of the land. That's not only what we did in court, but at events like the, the farewell parties of all three of us. We got emotional about the values in our Constitution, about the progress that our country has made, although it is far, far from where it is supposed to be, about the values that we, at the Constitution, that we believed in and that the Constitution states. Maybe just close this one. <coughs> and, um, and often there was tribute to Nelson Mandela, who was called the, the father of, of this democratic South Africa. Um, Justice Moseneke, I'll come back to you now, who was very close to Nelson Mandela, not only for 10 years on Robben Island, but in various of the organizations like the Mandela Trust and Children's Fund, etc. When I left the Constitutional Court, I came here, the student protests were uh, just busy getting, picking up a lot of speed, the year 2016, and I've learned a lot since then. Uh, I've learned a lot that one cannot just sit in some ivory tower and believe that everything is fine. One cannot accept that everybody regards Mandela as authority. In some circles, one is hardly allowed to quote him. Um, I accepted that the Constitution cannot be the end of the road and symbolize perfection. Our courses in our department, department where one of our speakers is also teaching, constantly talks about we teach the Constitution and beyond. So the beyond is there. Where, I don't know. That's why we arranged this discussion. Um, I realize that uh, poverty is at the heart of much of many of our problems. I saw students who protested, uh, wanted to commit suicide. Some of them did um, because they were on the verge of being suspended because of their uh, participation in, in, uh, in protests. I saw students on campuses who did not have money for lunch, who slept under other people's beds. And I saw lecturers who, are, who were very welcoming, but also lecturers who would then say in their courses that if you're stupid, you must leave my class, and I don't have talk, time to talk to stupid people, etc. Um, I realized at the time that to try to negotiate what a peaceful protest is in the middle of the protest is not going to work. So we do have a bit of a quiet time at the moment in the sense that there is no open violence. 
or as the revolutionary students in Free State called it when I was there on that day, they said we decided to terminate all academic activities. And the simple language is, in their own words, we decided to disrupt the classes. <laughs> so there is a bigger world out there than the one that constitutional courts, judges work with, but of course they are supposed to know that bigger world. To know that bigger world. But we all are and activists must also know that there's a bigger world. Um, some of them afterwards say my perspective have broadened, etc. So that's where we are. We chose the topic. I don't want to preempt the debate. We chose this topic, this constitution that we have. Firstly, can it heal the past? Some of the judgments I wrote in the Constitutional Court um, I made me think of that. How does one calculate the compensation that a family must get 40 years after they were kicked out of their house in Cape Town, a house they paid for because of the Group Areas Act. Justice Mosinek and I disagreed on that one, but the problem is, up is, is we just disagreed on the calculation. But for me, the calculation was of very little importance because the Briegel's biggest problem is how can one ever address that situation? I'm not talking about the truth and reconciliation process, we know about that. I'm talking about a range of things, of course, including the land issue. Can the Constitution regulate our present? And then, of course, can it deliver a just future? So to debate this, I have to first now apologize for uh, Dr. Chepu Madlingozi in my department. He was supposed to facilitate. He called me a short while ago. Uh, he says the mother of a friend of him was killed a few hours earlier and they are going to her house to, uh, to uh, give their sympathies. Um, the panelist who is not yet here, but on the way we sent somebody to pick him up from the Hatfield Gauteng train station. He's advocate Tembeka and Luka Tobi, um, who was also delayed because of a death of the mother of his colleague and friend, Dali Mpofu, the advocate. But he is at the station and on his way. Now, let me then start with him. Tebeka was a clerk at the, I'm not going to read CVs here. Um, Tebeka was, I think, the Chesterton's clerk at the Constitutional Court. He has been close to the court then in other structures, like helping us to choose um, people for uh, uh, bursaries, etc. He's a very, well-known practicing advocate, and he recently became famous with his book, The Land is Ours. And he said that he will focus on the land story. Uh, I wanted him to speak to the faculty in general, but perhaps we'll do that another time. The panelist, Justice Mosineke, my friend who made it clear to tell me here that I'm abusing friendship by telling him to be here on five days' notice. <laughs> And I will go backwards. At this stage, he is the president's special envoy trying to make peace in Lesotho. So he drove back from Osiru last night um, to be here. As you know, he was the deputy chief justice of South Africa. Many people thought he should be the chief justice a number of occasions. He was a judge of the Constitutional Court. Um, before that, he was a judge in the Pretoria High Court. Before that, a practicing advocate, very involved also in the business world. And before all of that, he was an attorney, and before that he was on Robben Island for 10 years from when he was 15 years old to 25 years old, close to people like Robert Sibukwe and Nelson Mandela, Walter Susulu, all of those. Next to him, my colleague and friend, Justice Zach Yacoub, <coughs> uh, judge of the Constitutional Court for, uh, for, the, for the fixed period that, that we are there. Before that, a practicing advocate, um, very much involved in political trials and also lots of other commercial issues, etc. Part of the constitutional uh, negotiations in Cape Town, Justice Mosineke was in the Kempton Park process, but very closely involved in Cape Town, uh, Justice Yacoub, and also as an activist who not only argued cases but who uh, was very often under fire during the apartheid years. And really, I'm not even apologizing for leaving our things. <laughs> uh, next to my, our three colleagues from the faculty. Karabu, most of you know, 
She is with the Centre for Child Law. Uh, she is a qualified attorney and she often practices as an attorney, especially if I understand correctly, regarding cases that the Child Law Centre take to the Constitutional Court and other courts. Uh, then uh, Dr. Joel Mudiri, you know, in the Department of Jurisprudence, got his doctorate in April this year, um, is very well known in South Africa and abroad for someone his uh, tender age, um, <laughs> is voted repeatedly as the best lecturer in the first year, but also people say that uh, he, uh, he drives people out of the class and people with EFF uniforms give some of his lectures and so on. <laughs> I actually got us five EFF berets, real ones, which um, Miss Caroline brought from um, the Popo, but I wouldn't force people to wear them. <laughs> um, so Joel Madiri is, is well known in South Africa and abroad in, in especially the critical race theory, critical gender theory, decolonization circles. Um, at the end there is, is um, Mayuri Pele, she is she, as you know, she teaches contract here, but she's a practicing advocate. She practices um, very, very actively, and she comes from the corporate world. She was um, a manager at ESCOM and at Deloitte and Touche, I think, and, and, and in several places. She does a lot of arbitrations, for example, because she's not only a lawyer, she also is a fully qualified engineer. Now, this is our... Um, <laughs> This is our panel, and um, I, Tebeka will join us when he's here, but I want to start with Justice Mosineke. I will now control the time, and I ask the panelists, please try to stay within the time. We're always late with these things, we're already late. But if, we, if you take each other's time away, and then there will be no time for questions. And um, I apologize for the time that I've taken away so far. Thank you very much. <laughs> to have other people listen to you. They're not obliged to, are they? No, they're not. Um, so the <clears throat> hope is that it will be worth their while to listen to you. In 15 minutes, it's quite difficult to say complicated things. In the manuscript of my second book, I go down memory lane <clears throat> and hope to tell the reader about my first impressions when I started studying the LLB on Robben Island. The first requirement, the first year, you had to pass Latin one, English one, Afrikaans Nether Dates one, Afrikaans Netherlands Nether Dates one. If you don't pass all three, you may not be admitted into the LLB course. And that triggered quite a thought about why should it be so? It doesn't complicate it. You are required to access essentially foreign law. And therefore you needed a foreign language to access foreign law. Foreign, yes. And I, and I make the proposition and, and advance it. And the proposition is the following, is that our law, and particularly the common law, Tembeck has appeared before me so, so many times. Uh, but you know, all playing fields get leveled out. Now we're sitting at the same level. <laughs> but let me, let me continue to make the point. You need a 
let Afrikaans leader that and you need have English because you had to access foreign law. And what does this really mean? It really means that you had to master the Roman Dutch law. So neither Roman nor Dutch are African. They have European origins. And if you were going to understand what the Churot has in store for us, or if you were at all going to understand what Van der Linde sought to say in his commentaries about Roman law, you needed to have the tools to access those. But this is an introduction to a much larger and more potent point. And the point is the following. Is that Roman Dutch law is part and was part of the colonial project. If you conquer people, you impose your law, and <clears throat> the best is to make the law common. In other words, it should bind everyone. Whatever their origin, station, and place, and you call it the common law. And whatever their wishes and their plans and their origins, the law is binding on them. And that is a normal adjunct of a colonial <coughs> project. If you don't impose your law, <coughs> the English tribe, this is, excuse me, the English tribe, this, <coughs> you try and allow indigenous law to survive, but you make the packing order quite clear. In the case of conflict between indigenous law and common law, or the important law, or the colonial law, the colonial law trumps indigenous law. And that's what happened at home in many ways. And so indigenous African law was stunted. It was ill-recorded. It found little space and sway and importance and respect because it sat under the shadow of the dominant law, which then became the common law. Now, when I started reading <coughs> again during my LLB, and I found that I had to read, of course, private law and commercial law and all other those laws. And one of the requirements, remember, that you had to pass at least mercantile law five, private law five, constitutional law three, criminal law three, and one sitting at the same time. So, besides all of this impediment, of course, there was a body intense sifting. But let me get to the point I really want to make. I never heard even once any of my professors candidly and openly confess to the fact that they were teaching an imposition. They were teaching Eurocentric law which had its origins in Rome and all those edicts and that were annotated in the 17th and <coughs> later 18th century by Grotius or de Groot, by Van der Kessel, by Matthäus, and Andrews were introduced from 1652 onwards into this part of the African continent. So it is a very tried and simple historical proposition that the law was part of the colonial project. We should not spend too much time on that, it's quite plain. And I go down to it and pass my LLB done, and I became and advocate and practice that common law and other derivatives of that law for many, for many years. Um, there never was though candor and acceptance and admission that in fact this is an extension and part of Eurocentrism on the march over the African continent and would therefore regulate lives. So if we settle on that and not pretend that this is homegrown natural state of regulating lives of people of the state, then the next question becomes, did the constitution make a difference? And that is the debate for today. Now those of you who don't know, and some of us have the privilege of being there in 1994, it was a big debate about whether or not to preserve the common law. Whether there should be a ground zero attempt to try and formulate new law, if you like, decolonized law. 
And in the end, the decision of the compromise was to maintain the common, common law, and therefore Roman Dutch law in that process, and to maintain and find space for indigenous law. To suggest, though, that 1994 had no significance is to make a category error. Because it was, we can debate how effectual it was, but we cannot suggest and debate that it, was, it had no historical significance. For us lawyers, one of the significance was the open eye to preserve the, to preserve Roman national to try and resuscitate and develop indigenous law, and to try and rearrange power relations within society. Let's talk about those power relations for a moment. Political power relations in our society were basically dominated initially by racism, which really is a product of the power relations and conquest of the colonial times. It was characterized by Ownership, exclusive ownership of means of production, which means your subjects will become poorer. It's a matter of time. If they have no land, they have no machinery, they have no capital, they will only be, and they have no proper education, they can only become poorer. And it happens so historically. So, the question must be asked, did 1994 have any meaning? suggest that it's a continuous, unmitigated sin, as I say, is to essentially to run over very important processes on how society changes. I think the one clear trigger was a transfer of political power. Of course, you're going to say it's not enough. It is not enough. Who would say it's enough? In fact, Nelson Mandela himself says it quite often. He admits that it was an imperfect transition because, in fact, there was no determination of crucial questions. And if you're going to look at the last chapter of my book, My Own Liberator, I confront that question, that the negotiations were never about curing economic inequality. It was curing political inequality. So let's not tie ourselves in knots and try and suggest that there was no political transfer. Obviously there was. It was the economic transfer, the answer is no. And then raises the question, what do you do about it? 